If you think of the Aleutians as an arm reaching out into the Pacific, the tip of the index finger pointing toward Japan is at two. Cold, bleak, and forbidding, Attu had been a forgotten and unwanted island until it suddenly sprang into the headlines as a Japanese beachhead threatening the security of the Western Hemisphere. While our heavy artillery pound Jap positions within earshot of the beach, the CBs go into action on the construction front. Today's beachhead becomes tomorrow's naval base. And coal is the sustenance upon which a naval base feeds and grows strong. Whether it's hand-to-hand -hand fighting or hand-to-hand -hand unloading, CB stevedores know their job. Like a line of ants, and just as tireless, they carry their heavy load across the barren slopes and valleys close behind the battle line. Huddled around the fire of their first pitched camp, it's a warming thought to realize that this desolate corner of the world is their own little piece of America. But the CBs are practical guys who like their warming chow along with their warming thoughts. And hot beans and a cup of java hit the spot on these sub-zero mornings when there's a day's work ahead to be finished by noon. With rifles on their backs or close at hand in case of enemy attack, they throw up temporary barracks. But materials for permanent quarters are on their way. 50 miles of tar paper. And buildings shipped in prefabricated sections that fit together like parts of a jigsaw puzzle. But a puzzle that CBs solve with lightning speed. For working in perfect teamwork, they shave a few precious minutes off their own record for setting up this unit. A good-sized, modern, and substantial hospital in five hours. In the States, gas stations may be opening late and closing early, but the Attu service station does business 24 hours a day. Transforming this barren little island into a flourishing base was a 24-hour-a-day job. Or, as the Seabees like to put it, a 36-hour-a-day job. But a job that was done, and finished in less time than the most optimistic American had hoped, or the most pessimistic Jap had feared. With the Aleutian chain anchored at one end by Dutch Harbor and on the other by Hattu, the enemy holding out on Kiska found himself hopelessly cut off from his source of supplies. But thoughtful Americans who like to read behind the headlines, the headline Yanks retake Hattu had become Seabees Consolidate Hattu. With the Aleutians back in American hands, hands that not only fired accurately but built swiftly, the finger pointing toward Japan clenched into a fist that could strike a direct and punishing blow at the enemy's heart. From other points in the Pacific, the left hook was being planned. The CBs put Midway back on the map. At Pearl Harbor, officers of the Civil Engineer Corps assisted in the salvaging of ships that had been irreparably lost, according to the Japanese press. A strange name in the far-off Solomons became a household word. Guadalcanal. At Guadalcanal, the Marines add a new verse to a famous song. The Marines sing a fighting song. But their most extravagant words were an understatement at Guadalcanal. Yes, when you say Guadalcanal, you say Marines. But those Marines will be the first to tell you that if they made history at Guadal, those Seabees working and fighting shoulder to shoulder with them made something more tangible than history. They made a thriving base out of the flaming wreckage that was left after Johnny Marine had proved his point to Mr. Tojo that this island was too small for the two of them.
With possession of Henderson Field, conclusion jumpers were congratulating each other on our domination of the South Pacific. For after all, wasn't Henderson Field the key to the Solomons? Yes, we had wrested a key from the Japs that was going to open some mighty important doors. But before that key could turn a single lock, it was badly in need of repair. The Seabees, digging into that airfield with the same fighting spirit as the Marines had hit the beach, repaired 53 shell and bomb craters in 48 hours. That would be a record in any league, but the Seabees hung up their record under fire. This one was a ship fitter first class, but he seems to be a first class gunner too. When Congressman Moss of Minnesota saw the CBs in action at Guadal, he reported, when Jap attacks were made, I saw CBs working on Henderson Field drop their tools, pick up their rifles and fight side by side with the Marines. When the attack was over, the CBs put down their guns, picked up their tools and calmly went back to work again. Just in time to fight off the enemy's most desperate counterattack, our fighter planes were able to use the runway. But the CBs didn't stop for any bows. They knew it was their job to put Quattle on the offensive. Widen the field. Lengthen the runway. Place the fill, grade the surface, level it off, make it navigable, not only for fighter planes, but for flying fortresses. In so short a time that even the slant eyes of the enemy opened wide, the field is ready. And as the first bomber takes off on its mission of softening up enemy bases for the landing operations ahead, the CBs win a two-fisted tribute from a two-fisted Marine. Lieutenant General Vandergrift, who said, I don't know how we would have gotten into the air without the sea beams. The spectacular speed with which bombing operations got underway from Henderson Field played havoc with the Japanese timetable of conquest in the Solomons. Bases from which the enemy planned great offensives found themselves desperately on the defensive. Every day our bombers were carrying the mail to Munda, Kolombangara, and Bougainville the mail that contained nothing but bad news for Hirohito. If the Japs were to regain their initiative in this theater, their rising sun had to go up over Henderson Field again. This was the aim of the powerful enemy fleet which sought to pierce our naval defense of Guadalcanal. 75 